at sea. Your ship sails through waters deep enough to bury the rocky mountains. Waves swamp your bow. Compared to the vast ocean that surrounds you, you are insignificant. And yet, you have thousands of lives on board, and 70 of the world's most advanced fighter and attack aircraft. Were it not for these jets, strapped almost unnaturally to your steel decks, your carrier would be nothing more than a seagoing hotel. But they are there, and it is the job of the carrier and its crew to get them airborne and back home safely again. You hear about national security and power projection, but you deal with far more practical concerns. You make the carrier work. Why? Because in the deep draft seas of blue water operations, if the carrier fails to support its jets, then for those pilots, there's truly nowhere else to go. The advent of the airplane was of immediate interest to military planners, but it was only in the sea that there became true believers. In demonstrations such as these, small frail biplanes darting about on fabric wings made true on the promise that the airplane would be a valuable military asset. A sudden appreciation for the war-making potential of an airplane spurred the Navy into action. The objective? To fit ships with devices that could launch and recover aircraft while underway. Using the sea was easy enough for the recovery, but it was in the launching that problems arose. The first solutions consisted of platforms mounted across the gun turrets and variations on that theme. It was all too obvious that jury-rigged platforms and catapult tracks fell terribly short of the mark. Naval aviation had much more potential than this. The answer? A ship dedicated to carrying planes. She was called the Langley, and she would be followed by the Lexington and the Saratoga.
Their decks would become beehives of activity, and each flight, each success or mishap, would progressively lift the fog bank of confusion shrouding this uncharted but unquestionably vital effort to mate the airplane and the ship. World War II brought carrier aviation to the front burner, and if anything became certain during World War II, it was this. In taking the war to the Pacific, no military asset packed more firepower than the aircraft carrier. Carrier operations, though, posed tremendous challenges to the pilots. Until the late 1950s, there was only one flight deck design, and it was called the straight deck. A pilot landed aft, flying squarely into, but stopping short of, an intimidating wall of parked aircraft on the bow. Furthermore, widespread use of the catapult was yet years off. All told, the straight deck layout left little room for error.
Just as the carrier was a key asset for naval strategists, killing the carrier was the enemy's highest priority. Indeed, the carrier was so important that tragic extremes such as the kamikaze were devised to put them on the bottom. The USS Forrestal introduced the angled flight deck. Few innovations have done more for naval aviation and the naval aviator than the angled flight deck. Finally, there was separation between the landing area and the parking and takeoff areas. No longer would pilots face rows of aircraft as they recovered aboard the ship. The new challenge was to adjust the landing pattern to hit a flight deck crabbing away from the aircraft's direction of flight a small price to pay for a quantum leap in safety. Four, 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 four. 
Despite a flight deck over 1,000 feet long, even a fleet carrier like the USS Nimitz is soon crowded with the aircraft she carries. Spotting an aircraft, day or night, is part art and part skill. Weaving through a seemingly impassable jam of crew and aircraft and bringing the nose gear to within inches of the deck edge all seems impossible to the distant observer. Survival for the flight deck personnel means keeping your head on a swivel, your hands close to your body, and your exposure on the deck limited to the absolute minimum. Sometimes deck capacity limits necessitate unpleasant extremes. As refugees streamed aboard during the evacuation of Vietnam, helo pilots had no choice but to dump their mounts into the sea. It is an unnatural thing to do, and often jumping out in flight was the only way to avoid the helo's rapid floundering. Most feared of all carrier disasters at sea is fire. 
with over 750,000 gallons of aviation fuels, tons of ordnance and her magazines, large hangar decks below, and a full complement of fighters and bombers on top, the smallest fire can rage quickly out of control. So it happened on the USS Forrestal. In 1967, while operating off Vietnam, an A-4 Skyhawk's engine flash ignited a sidewinder under the wing of an F-4 Phantom, which fired broadside into the fuel tank of yet another A-4. Ready for airstrikes, many jets were spotted close together, fueled and armed, and a chain reaction was set into motion that would claim 164 lives, blow seven holes into the flight deck with flames burning down through six of the 10 decks below. Today's naval bombs now have heat-resistant jackets that delay cooking off long enough to dump them overboard. aircraft grew in size and weight, and with the advent of the jet, catapults grew in importance. Used just 40% of the time during World War II, today's fleet carrier has four cats and launches every aircraft she carries. Setting the pressure, though, is a vital job on deck and begins with extensive shore-based testing. At issue is this, what amount of pressure is enough to get an aircraft airborne without inducing a structural failure? Attaching the aircraft to the CAT has challenged developers for years. Depending on aircraft type and gear assembly, both bridles and shuttles were used. 
each operated in a similar manner. A launch bar or bridle would connect the aircraft to the cat, and a holdback fitting would restrain the aircraft until the cat officer initiated the launch. Some aircraft launched with their nose wheel clear of the deck, while others adjusted downward into the shuttle. A naval aviator plans for the worst and briefs contingencies before each cat launch. A pilot likes nothing better than the sure feel of a solid cat stroke. The alternative, a soft or cold cat, usually means a lost aircraft and a hot seat into the drink, which is just the first of a long list of potential problems during the launch. Locked flight controls, improper attitude, structural failures, and more contribute to cat launch mishaps. The Landing Signal Officer, or LSO, part of the package that helps a pilot get on board the ship. Their experience as naval aviators and time and training as LSOs give them unusual authority over the approaching aircraft. They give advisories for lineup, power, and altitude, and they give orders. The most important, wave off. And no matter what you flew, flying the wave off had challenges of its own.
Aiding the pilot and the LSO is the meatball, an optical landing aid gyro-stabilized to provide accurate glide slope information. A centered meatball means you're in the fat of the glide slope. Blinking red lights indicate a wave off. Recoveries are a naval aviator's most challenging phase of flight. With steady seas and a bright sun, pilots will say they can cat and trap all day long. Add, though, an in-flight emergency, mechanicals, blown gear, pitching decks, or low fuel states with no diverts, and the recovery becomes a test of confidence, skill, and nerves.
It has been said that no job is more hazardous than carrier air operations, and yet few Navy pilots would trade their seat for an F-15 or F-16. They know the men and women around them are trained as well as any people in the world. Trained and steeped in the knowledge that they must do their jobs well, because steaming across the vast expanse of the ocean, for this challenge of flight, there's nowhere else to go.